All right. Uh, just want to get started on this right now and uh, like to introduce myself and welcome everybody out on board. This is the uh, first of the webinars for uh, the Multifamily Investing Academy for 2012. Um, for those of you that uh, have uh, been to some of our webinars in the past, you understand that the whole idea is to try to, try to provide you with as much information as we possibly can. Uh, today our topic is going to be on the repositioning of apartment complexes and as the topic said in the uh, email that went out to everyone, it's uh, what the gurus never teach you. And um, as I mentioned, my name is Charlie Dobbins, and along with my partner, Jillian Sidoti, uh, we are the co-founders of the Multifamily Investing Academy. Uh, Jillian is an attorney uh, specializing in securities law, and I'm an attorney specializing in really working with uh, investors uh, for all of their multifamily acquisitions, uh, from broker development to deal review, from pre-qualifying uh, you with uh, lenders, uh, to teaching you how to structure your deals the best way. We have the whole team in place uh, to get you through really any type of acquisition. Now in that vein, and this is my my plug, is um, uh, this is my plug, is that we have started at the MFIA, uh, the Acquisition Advisory Program. Some people would call it a, a coaching program, but believe me, that really does not do it justice. Um, as you know, many of you might know, they say that 98% of commercial real estate students never do their first deal. And what we're doing is representing those other 2% and helping them get to their first deal and get their first deal done. Uh, if you'd like more information about it, you can send us an email to info at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com. Uh, but if you'd really like to find out more about the program and how it works, don't ask us. Just ask some of our clients uh, who are in the program now. Uh, and many, if not all of them, were in some other guru's coaching program and can tell you the, the big differences between our program and anything else that we've seen out there. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Jillian and I started this program is, is uh, because over the last several months we've become privy to some coaching uh, contracts with these uh, gurus that charge exorbitant amounts of money up front and the con contracts that they put you under essentially make you an indentured servant to the guru. Uh, if any bank knew that you had to assign 50% of the rental income of the property to your coach as payment for learning how to buy that property, you would never be approved for a loan. And believe it or not, these are some of the deals that we've seen uh, go on out there. So that is why we started our uh, advisory acquisition Acquisition Advisory Program, and uh, that is uh, how we're trying to help out these new investors so they don't get burnt by, uh, by some of these programs. Um, all right, now, having said that, let's get started. Uh, today's webinar is uh, essentially uh, completely sold out. Um, if you drop off the line, you may have trouble getting back on. Uh, we will be uh, making this webinar available on the MFIA members site in the next few days, um, and it, which we do with all of our webinars, all of our contracts, any forms that we have, all of our, our teaching material. Uh, it's all behind the scenes on the uh, member site. Um, you know, you can also get uh, sometimes get some free legal advice as well during our live uh, TV Ustream sessions that Julie and I put on for our members. Um, one of the biggest things that I see on a regular basis when dealing with new investors uh, is that they have this idea that they're going to make millions if they could just buy a C property in a B area or a B property in an A area and just reposition it. And the problem that I feel exists is that they never truly understand what it takes to reposition a property. You know, if it was really that easy to make millions that way, don't you think the existing owner would have done, done it long ago? Uh, let me f start off by saying that I'm actually coming to this, uh, this conversation and this discussion uh, from a position of, of uh, power, so to speak. Uh, I actually have been on both sides of this equation. Uh, one of my properties uh, was nominated last year for a um, Paragon Award uh, with the National Apartment Association as one of the best turnaround properties of 2011 uh, by an owner-operator. So 
in that regard, I've done it. I know how to do it. It's uh, an exciting way to run this business. But let me just also tell you that I, I unfortunately was involved in, as a, uh, a member of an um, investor group that didn't do so well with the repositioning property, where we went into the A property and tried to turn it around, and it was a C property in a B area. Um, and I can tell you that um, at the end of the day, we failed. And we ended up giving that property back to the existing owner. Um, and I can tell you the number one thing that determined the failure and success in both of those cases was the team that we had in place. Uh, in the successful case, the team we had on was brilliant. They worked well together. They knew what the objectives were. They knew what the goals were every single month. And they achieved them. The uh, other team uh, had no idea what it would take to reposition a property and it showed uh, marvelously let me just say so today uh, let me introduce for you uh, Robert Lang the repositioning guy uh, Robert is the go-to guy when it comes to learning and understanding about how to reposition an apartment complex so if you are thinking about doing just what I said, acquiring property by and then repositioning that property, and you've not, never done it before, this conversation is going to be very, very important to you. Uh, and I think you're going to um, really get a great handle on just what it takes to reposition a property. So without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome Robert to the call and uh, say hello. How are you, Robert? Good. I agree. I think that this particular topic is glossed over uh, at a lot of these training seminars and uh, it sounds great, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can truly get burned. Uh, and uh, you know that's what we're here to tell people uh, how to do it the right way. So let me get your slide up. Can you see the screen, Art? Okay, great. So I'm, it's going to be a slow transition here for some reason. I'm just trying to move you to the next slide. So, okay, here we go. Why don't you take it over, Robert?
Mm -hmm. Great. Now, actually, you know, this question right here, what is repositioning? You think, you know, a lot of people may think that they, well, it do, it doesn't everybody understand what repositioning is? When we put, sent out the, uh, the invite to everyone to join this webinar a week or so ago, a couple of people actually wrote back and they, they didn't understand or know what repositioning was or what opportunities existed with repositioning. So I think it is very good that we, we start right from the beginning here with this. You know, one of the things that, if I can just go back to the property that we failed on, it, it, this point that you raise here really brings back some bad memories. And the thing was that we didn't start thinking about the repositioning and all the aspects of the, of the repositioning until after we purchased the property. It was like we purchased the property, you know, the, the baby was born, everybody had the big party, and then somebody had to get down there and run it. The other problem that we had was the team that we had in place of five people, we had five leaders. Nobody was a was a follower. Everybody thought that the other person was doing something on the job. So the team was never well defined. We didn't have one leader for the repositioning, and it just failed miserably. Exactly. Yeah, and that person has to have control. They they can't, you know, sit around and wait for somebody else to act. They've got to be able to pull the trigger on decisions. Yeah. Let me see. Okay.
Now, at the end of the, the webinar, you are going to make available to anyone that contacts you a one of your customized uh, um, uh, repositioning plans. Uh, can you kind of give us an idea as to, you know, kind of a broad overview of, of what you would find in a repositioning plan? That is great because what some people don't even understand is they'll get in. Here's what we did on one property. We went in there and it was an older property with beautiful hardwood floors, but it had carpeting over the hardwood floors. And we thought, oh man, if we just rip out these hard, these car, this carpeting and finish the hardwood floors, this place will look fantastic. But what we didn't realize is that the market didn't want hardwood floors. They didn't want bare floors. They wanted carpeted floors because they didn't own carpeting and they weren't bringing carpeting to their new unit. So we couldn't move any of those units. So we didn't do that market survey that you're talking about. Exactly. And your final bullet point here on this one. There's your story time. I'm sorry I was, there was your high rise. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's interesting. You talk about the stereotyping of a property and 
as a, you know, if you come in from somewhere, another part of the country into a particular marketplace and you're looking to buy a property, you've got to find out, get your boots on the ground and find out what do people think of that property? What is, what is, what is the market for that? You know, the property that we bought, you know, it was, it was where the gangs lived. And, you know, how did we know that? So... Nice. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yep. And especially, you know, the brokers just want you to think that their properties are beautiful. So now here come the warning signs. And they're, they're out there, folks. Uh, you know, Take it from take it from experience. You, you go into these things with your eyes wide open. So uh, let's let's uh, let's talk trash here a little bit, Robert. Yeah, mailbox money. But don't ever, please don't ever call me a guru. <laughs> please, don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that the reason why, you know, I like working with you, Robert, is, you know, we, we come at this from the same mindset of, you know, what we call value in advance, where, you know, 
we want to help, we want to work with our clients first, get to know us, find out if we're the right fit before, you know, you sign on to working with us. And that goes to, if, if anyone's on the call right now, and you're looking at a repositioning deal, and you're thinking that you're going to make an offer on it, pick up the phone and call Robert and say, hey, let me just run something past you. I mean, let us help you out before you even get yourself into any trouble. And that's, that's the thing is, you know, a pound of, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And believe me, I see that all the time in my practice. There are so many people that if they just picked up the phone and called me for a 10-minute free phone call, I would have directed them entirely differently on what they would have done with that, with that transaction and probably would have saved them a, a ton of uh, problems. So if you're thinking about, about repositioning, get to know Robert. Put him on your speed dial. Shoot him an email. He's there to help you out, and uh, you know that's how he how he builds his practice. Now give us a story about this Indianapolis property. All right, let, let's talk about that for a second because you raise an issue that uh, for someone who I deal with acquiring property every single day, and if I looked at a rent roll and I looked at, at um, the lease up of a property that I'm looking to acquire, you know, helping a client acquire, and I see that 60 units were leased in one week, that sends up a red flag to me. And I look at it and I think to myself, well, the guy was obviously just trying to put, you know, any warm body in that particular place. Now, that's on the acquisition side. But if you are purchase a property and you're looking to do a, a repositioning and you want someone like you, Robert, to come in and, and load up the place, how can you protect yourself and your business from getting just another warm body in, in place? What do you do?
That's great. Now, you know, it's funny you mentioned something about what uh, residents will say. I, I got a phone call from one of my property managers asking me if I had agreed to move a heating duct away from someone's bed to the other side of the room uh, in order to lease the unit. And I hadn't been to the property in three months, and this guy had just moved in. I said, it wasn't me. He says, no, he says the owner told him he would move that heating duct for him. And I said, well, that guy's you know coming up with lines because it definitely was not me. And sh sure enough, the guy was just trying to get out of the lease early. That's why he said it. So hey, let me ask you uh, another question. Let's say that you, you acquire a 150-unit um, a, you know, property. You've got uh, you know, 15 buildings spread out across a complex. Um, the property is 50% occupied, and you've got people in different units throughout the, pr the property. What would be the best way to go about, you know, and the whole idea is you're going to get in the, into these units and turn them and clean them up and get them moved on. Is it better to take everybody out of one particular building and, and work on a building at a time, or would it be better to work around the existing uh, resident base and uh, fix up the other units and then come back to their units? How would you handle that? Right. You know, that's a gr great point you ra raised about understanding the stock, the available stock of units that you have. Um, we had one property that had uh, about six different floor plans, and, you know, we had a problem. We couldn't get certain units uh, leased, and, and we didn't even know until somebody sat down and did a complete audit that the units we couldn't get leased were all the exact same floor plan. They were our smaller two bedrooms. We were completely sold out of one bedroom units and you know turning people away every day uh, while we had about 50 other units that just were sitting there. So we realized that, geez, if we could just go back there and remarket these units as uh, deluxe one bedrooms or uh, you know one bedrooms with a bonus room, uh, then we could charge a little bit more and w in no time flat we had all of the units uh, rented. So it is, that's a great point about understanding what your stock is and its availability throughout the repositioning.
Mm. You know, uh, there's a question here from Christopher G. where he says, uh, ever thought about using video during an application interview or lease signing, et cetera, virtually irrefutable and, and complete documentation, plus the digital, vid digital video can be stored, organized, archived, clouded, and, um, you know, some of the, one of the things that that, I've never thought about using something like that for the application process, uh, but, and this ties in with what you were just saying about out-of-state out of uh, owners, is you've got to, we haven't done it yet, but we are, we've looked into it on a couple of properties, set up the, the webcams for different parts of the property. And, you know, there, uh, somebody gave a demonstration one time where you can put a webcam, uh, you know, right, the guy was showing me right from his iPod, he could look at, at everything, he could turn the camera right from his iPod, uh, iPad, and he could see everything that was going on in the property. It all gets archived, all gets recorded, and it was, it was the slickest thing I've ever seen. So, haven't thought about it for, for videotaping the application inter interviews, but definitely, especially if you're an out-of-state owner, that is something you should, should, you should put in the budget when you're going to buy that property. Hey, I did, Christopher G is on a tear. Let me just read you this this question that he just put up. Sometimes he gets intimidated out there uh, by these big, smart, rich REITs and corporate real estate groups. Is this justified, or am I psyching myself out unnecessarily? Big, successful groups are just as boneheaded as anyone else. And Christopher, you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, bad decisions are made by by everybody. So uh, yeah, don't be intimidated. Uh, believe me, that guy goes home every night, and he's he's wondering whether he made the right decision or not himself so yeah it, it we're all the same everybody's the same in this business we, we you know the there's no uh, cutting edge stuff in the multifamily business they've been renting units for thousands of years now uh, so believe me these guys they just have a lot more money and they're a lot more uh, pizzazz but they still have to make their numbers work just like everybody else so and look at I mean if you go through the the CMBS database if you go through uh, and you look at some of the these these portfolios of properties that are going back to the lenders because these REITs and these um, uh, large corporate uh, players purchase them at the wrong time for too much money they're losing their whole entire portfolio it'll be gone in the next year or two and that's where you know an opportunity exists for the smaller players to go pick up some of these deals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, let me just. There was one. What would you consider a full team for an out-of-state investor? Like, say, say someone called you up. Say, you know, somebody from uh, Washington is looking to buy a property in uh, Oklahoma. You know, this happens to be a, a case on right now for a client. Let's say it's an 80-unit property. He's in Washington. Um, you're in uh, New York. The property is in Oklahoma. It's a repositioning deal. What? What? He hasn't. He hasn't closed in the deal. We're going. He's starting the due diligence process. How would you interact with him?
Right. Yeah. Yeah. One other question here is: is if for an out of per, out of state person looking to go in and do a due diligence in a property, uh, should they hire uh, a um, you know who should they hire? Uh, what type of an inspection team? Um, and uh, how much should that cost um, to do the due diligence? Here, here's the thing with due diligence: you've got to look at due diligence as essentially having two components. The first component is the financial due diligence that can be done in your office back home. That means when you execute the contract, the, the all the paperwork gets put packaged together. Everything that's on the uh, the Schedule One, as we call it with our uh, letter of intent, uh, and the, our purchase and sale, everything that's on the Schedule One gets shipped to your office. And for the first two weeks of the contract, you're going to go through the financial due diligence of that property with a fine tooth comb. If it meets muster, if it's if it turns out to be what they said it was, then the second phase of the due diligence is the physical due diligence, where you actually get somebody out there to the property that can uh, take a look at the, at the property uh, unit by unit. Now, here's the thing. It, there are a couple of different ways to do it. I've done it where I've paid $40 per unit for a guy to go in and do everything, from the roof down to the foundation, inside every single cabinet of every single unit, and I... And at the end of the day, I wrote him a check, and he gave me a nice 20-page uh, report of what the property looked like. As I became more experienced in multifamily, I only hired a property inspector to go out there and do the physical plant type of, of uh, analysis, things I couldn't do, like the roof, the foundation, the HVAC, uh, the furnaces, the chiller boiler system. And all of those types of things is what I hired a property inspector for. My partners and I could go into each unit. We knew what we were looking for, we knew uh, what we were trying to price out, we knew what type of damages we were, we were looking for, and we didn't have to pay an inspector to go off and do all of that stuff. I can tell you right now, for the person that asked that question, everything is negotiable. So if you get a price from one inspector, find another one and, and, and uh, see if you can... Um, you can get a better number from that other person. I think it was about $25 per unit uh, is what some guys were charging. The last time I did a uh, property inspection, I think it was about a 180-unit property, and it cost me $2,500 for the person to go and do the physical inspection of the exterior of the property. I did everything on the inside. So that's. I hope I answered that question for you. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to watch the time here. We're going to try to keep it down to an hour, so I'm just going to run through a couple of these final slides for you. But as people, if you have any questions, uh, if you haven't discovered it yet, there's a box uh, on your um, on the side of your screen uh, using the GoToWebinar uh, menu. You can type in a question, and I will uh, share it with uh, Robert. But I want to make sure we, we keep this down to an hour. So, uh, Robert, why don't you help us uh, with this identifying some of the profit niches?
That's great. Robert, one question is, what are some examples of physical things you can do to, that make major impacts? How do you decide what or which things to upgrade? Now, here's a question. How do you deal with and improve properties that are located in a higher crime neighborhood? And, man, I know, I know from personal experience, I know the answer to this question, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, you talk about selective. I, I look at it, and you know, I've 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 done it once. I'll never do it again. And you uh, know, I've learned my lesson. A high crime area, that's that's not for me. I mean, you you go in some of those areas, and I, I hear so many investors try to sell me on the fact that oh, this area, this neighborhood is changing. Oh, this area is being regentrified. Yeah, you know what? It's going to take ten years for it to get to any different type of level, and it might never get there. And you don't have the time to wait. For this neighborhood to come back, so you know, I, I you know, and like we were talking offline before, you know, when you come into a neighborhood, when you come, especially if you're from out of town and you don't know the area all that wet well, one street away can make a huge difference in the value of your property. I mean, I've talked to some investors in Baltimore who say that. I know personally that that's the case in Cincinnati. Uh, cer certain parts of Fort Worth are the same way. If you buy one street away 
where you think you're getting into a good neighborhood, but you purchased, you know, just down the road, you, it, the property has got a a, um, a stereotype to it of being a a bad property, and you're not going to be able to do anything to change that. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to just run through a couple of these questions, probably get away from the presentation. Some of these questions are, are really good. Um, this is from uh, I, I, Richard uh, asked, must the property be in a higher ranking neighborhood? For example, uh, you know, a C property in a B neighborhood, does it make sense to try to reposition a B minus property in a B minus neighborhood? What are your thoughts on that? Um, this is from uh, one of my, my favorite uh, friends here, Ken Lavisa. He says, uh, how do you determine how fast you can get the, the vacants leased up? And this is a great question because when you're doing the analysis, and Ken happens to be an accountant, so I know where he's coming from. When you're doing the analysis and trying to come up with a budget for the repositioning and, and estimating your carrying costs, people sometimes get a little too uh, aggressive in their um, analysis of how quickly they'll be able to get the rents up to an occupancy that, they, that they're projecting. How, what's a realistic formula or what's a realistic way to look at how long it's going to take to take a, a property that needs to be repositioned at 50% occupancy all the way up to the market occupancy of let's say 90%? How, how do you determine that? Right, exactly. That's a great point. Uh, you have to understand uh, when the um, you know when the leasing season is for those properties. Um, here's here's. I just thought you got a kick out of this one. Uh, hard to believe Robert is a property guy. He seems so mellow and laid back. But yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wow. <laughs> now, Mike, uh, Mike from Cincinnati says, uh, and I know Mike owns a couple of properties up there in Ohio, uh, he asked the question, when does it make sense to change the name of the property? 
This is a great point because we actually, we changed the name of one of our properties because it had such a bad connotation. And there was another property with an even worse, uh, worse reputation um, with a very similar name. And we turned it into a, a, um, a uh, kind of like a, a game among the residents where whoever got the best name got one month's free rent. And everybody started really getting into it. But when does it make sense to change the name of the property? Now, uh, uh, Bob, uh, Bob from Washington asks, what if, what, if any, is the downside of properties with a high efficiency or one bedroom unit mix? And uh, you know, I know the answer to this. I would love to hear what you have to say about it. What, if any, is the downside of properties with a high efficient, a number of efficiencies or a number of one bedroom unit mix? Meaning you have a lot more ones or efficiencies than you do twos or threes. Um, let's talk about the, some of these mi mind falls that we talked about. We want to get this in there before we um, before we end the call, so that people have a, a better understanding. I mean, some of the things that you and I had talked about before. Um, you know, number one, of course, is is finding out the problems before you buy the property. And new investors sometimes don't know where to look uh, to find where the problems are. Um, you know, I, I can sit here and tell you war stories about about things that owners tried to hide. Uh, but this is uh, probably the first thing you need to, to walk around uh, when you're looking to buy a property is finding out what's out there beforehand. Um, you... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I, yeah, I can I can add to that. I mean, if you're, uh, we had a property that had you know for the whole time that we're going through the due diligence was showing up as ninety seven percent occupied, and the day thirty days after we bought the property, it was at fifty two percent occupied, and not one moving van had ever moved up to take anybody out. So the the existing owner who happened to own property in in the in the area uh, was taking leases from other properties and then. Sticking them into our rent roll to make it look like the property is at 97% occupied, and you know there are ways to you know to protect against that. But if someone's going to try to commit fraud against you, you know they can always they'll they'll always hide it as best they can. Um, the other thing is uh, what we were talking about: know the submarket. And this is kind of one of the things we talked about before was the b things being one street away. Uh, you know, and that's that's part of the problem is that. Um, you know, if you don't know the market all that well, and you think you're buying in a great area, 
but the neighbors and, and all the other investors in that town wouldn't touch it, you might want to think twice before you jump into that into that repositioning deal. Yeah. You know, somebody asked a question, is repositioning like value add? And it absolutely is. Wouldn't you agree? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we have a question here, I think it's from Terry, uh, where he asks that question, what is a typical profit margin on a repositioning deal as a percentage of the total project cost? That's a tough, the, the way the question is worded is, is, is tough to give you any type of concrete numbers, but maybe you can kind of share a little bit with what, um, you know, even just using it from a unit uh, cost um, acquisition price uh, to what, you know, what ends up being the uh, the value of the property at the end uh, from your experience, Robert? Yeah. Excellent. Um, let me see. Yeah, somebody said uh, naming. We're talking about naming the property. Make sure you don't have a similar name to a local housing project. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, okay, don't, do not mistake the map for the territory. It amazes me how many people have their noses buried in their precious spreadsheets but fail to see the most basic common sense dynamics. Uh, you know, like they said, garbage in, garbage out. Don't show me the pretty graphs, projections, and models. If the assum assumptions are dumb, the whole thing is irrelevant. And of course, trust but verify. And I think that you and I, you and I said that same thing. You know, perestroika, I, uh, trust but verify. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, so. You know, oh, no, yeah, it's, uh, you know, those are, let me just, I keep jumping back and forth here. Um, you know, this last screen, um, and before we wrap up the call, it's, it just so happens that uh, we have a question that's that very similar to what we're talking about here. Um, somebody asked, says, we keep talking about the team, uh, but who is on the team? Um, your, you know, your uh, attorney, your leasing manager, your maintenance person. I mean, who is it on the repositioning team?
Right. You know, and, and just so people understand how, you know, Robert and I would work together, it really is my my focus is on the deal analysis, helping you find the property, helping you negotiate the deal, structure the deal, draft the letter of intent. We draft the purchase and sale contract. You know, and, and I say that we help you find the deals and get into a, a property. At the same time, one thing that we, we spend as much time on is keeping you out of bad deals. We see a lot of bad properties come across our desk uh, that uh, investors think uh, looks, looks nice, and we, we just really counsel them on what would happen if they were to purchase that property. So we want to make sure that, that our clients uh, do well by buying well. Um, but once we have, have uh, got you set up with owning the property, if it is a repositioning opportunity, and that's been your strategy all along, during the acquisition process, we will bring Robert in to start working and looking at the numbers and coming up with a strategy towards so that when you transition to ownership, you're going to have everything in place right from the very beginning all the way through to success uh, with essentially two different teams, my team and uh, Robert's team. So that's, that's what we, we mean when we talk about teams and how Robert and I interact with each other. You know, and this this last question here, this last uh, comment that somebody made. Uh, so you're the guys that check to see how deep the water is, and the answer is yeah. That's exactly what we do. We we jump in first to make sure that you're you're going to be able to swim all right. That's uh, I like it. I'm probably going to use that one. So let's uh, let's wrap it up today, uh, Robert. Why don't you? I've, I've received a lot of questions that I have not answered regarding how people work with you, what your costs are, uh, you know, what, what what does it cost to hire a guy like you? Um, I I I privately sent a message back to those people saying we're not talking price on this phone call. If you have any questions about price uh, or working with Robert, please contact him directly. I think that's always the best way to do this. You, you know, you you um you know let him find out what you're looking to do and. and the main thing is see if he's the right fit for you. That's the key. Um, so you know, I think a you know a conversation with him would be would be a, incredibly beneficial. So, but if you're on the call today, Robert is going to make time available for you. So, um, Robert, why don't you give out your contact information and and a little bit more about what you're what you're going to do for people. That's great, and uh, folks, uh, you know, I obviously some of you on the call know me, uh, work with me in the past. You know uh, the type of people I work with. I I cannot recommend Robert strongly enough. Um, in you know, it, it, I think you kind of got the sense of, of how he operates. Very low key, uh, exactly the way uh, you know I like to do business. Where you know, if if he's the right fit, um, you know, give him a call. He, he's an easy guy to work with. So. Um, one final. Let me just make sure that uh, we don't have. Yeah. So, and and also, if you, if any of you need to contact us, you can you can reach us at info at multifamilyinvestingacademy dot com, or my personal uh, email is charles at Dobbins Law, and Dobbins is spelled 
D as in dog, O, B as in boy, E-N-S-L-A-W dot com, Dobbins Law. Uh, just send me an email. I'll be more than happy to uh, uh, to talk to you about uh, what you've got going on. So, hey, Robert, i got to thank you uh, for doing this for us. I think it was a great call, very, very informative. Um, I think we've, we've piqued people's curiosity enough. And the key thing that I can stress out there is, folks, when you're, and I know a lot of you are doing this, and I know some of you don't have any experience in it, but if you're looking at repositioning opportunities, it's a great way to make a whole lot of money. Just make sure you know what you're doing, and if you don't know what you're doing while you're analyzing a deal, pick up the phone and call Robert, pick up the phone and call me. Let's just talk about it and uh, give you some direction as to how to proceed forward. So um, that is it, Robert. I want to thank you so much for your uh, time, and I think uh, we have a special gift for you, as we do for all of our guests. I'm only kidding. That's, that's from the old, uh, old thing. But um, I want to uh, just uh, thanks, and, and I hope everybody uh, liked it. And, um, and uh, we look forward. Next month, we, have one, we, we already have two webinars lined up for next, next, uh, next two times. I don't know which one's going to be first. One of them is going to be on deal structuring, not on deal analysis, but on deal structuring. How do you take a um, kind of a crazy deal? We'll look at a couple of deals. How do you take a couple of crazy deals and uh, and structure an offer uh, that'll satisfy what the um, what the owner is looking for? That's one of the upcoming webinars. Another webinar that we have coming up is with an actual asset manager uh, for a lender. Uh, who we're going to talk to about how do you how do they approach restructuring notes, restructuring deals? Um, how do they speak to uh, investors uh, who are looking to take over some property that's non-performing? And so we can really get a perspective uh, from the bank's standpoint. That that phone call is going to be fantastic. So please uh, keep your eyes peeled for the invitations. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And now uh, we'll see you next time. Talk to you soon.